I'm very, I'm very honored to present this lecture here in, for the Kagin Conference 2020 at a place where so many important achievements have been made in polymer science. 2020 is the year exactly 100 years later than the paper of Staudinger by which he claimed that polymers or plastic materials consist of macromolecules, long chain molecules. And I would like to go through the histories, through the development of this. But before I start with this, I want to make a short remark about how does these type of developments some way uh, be successful in there. And there's one old, very old philosophical point about this. Even if you're a dwarf, if you sit on the shoulders of a giant in there, you can look further than this giant can look because your head will be higher than that of the giant in there. Now this was done, or well, this, this, this quote became also famous because of Isaac Newton. He used it in a letter to Robert Hooke his colleague at Oxford University. And he said a little bit mean, if I could have looked further, it's because I was standing on the shoulders of such giants. And the point why he could look further was because he could do differential equations in there. Now, we have to think about this all the time and we want to look what was the development which finally led to the concept of macromolecules and where did the concept of macromolecules lead us to? Now, plastic is everywhere, polymers are everywhere now, and like it is done in this beautiful book by Alexander Grossberg and Alexei Hochloff, and they're here, there, and everywhere. We cannot imagine our world anymore without polymers around there. And even if we would not have polymers, we still need the macromolecules in order to have life on the Earth. Now let's look a little bit how this all developed. The, the term polymer was first used apparently by Basilius in 1832. And still he did not know what he meant by polymer. It was to describe something which was apparently important, but what was the origin of it? It was not really clear. So what was the situation at that time? For example, a German pharmacist distilled styrene from a resin of an amber tree, and when he let it sit in the sun, it became solid, and it turned out that this solid had the same elemental composition as the liquid had. At that time, this was remarkable because people thought if they know the elemental composition, they know what kind of stuff they have in their hand. Now, that led Bertelot to, to, the, to use the term polymerization for this type of isomerism, same, same elemental composition, but completely different properties in there. And also at that time, people already had a lot of different polymers in there. So ethylene oxide could be polymerized by adding it to water and polymer acrylic acid has been described. Even epsilon amino caproic acid could be polymerized to what we call it now nylon six in there. There was also the first papers, very impressive, on synthetic rubbers, which only became important really much later in there, which was done in Russia in here. And a very remarkable report was by Amy Fisher, who synthesized a 15 mer of a peptide. And that means he had 15 amino acids linked to it together to a chain in here. It's remarkable. You could think nowadays that this would be enough to demonstrate that you have macromolecules, chain molecules. It wasn't at that time. So there were a lot of polymers around. People had an idea about that something happened and they called it polymerization, which changed the materials properties in there particularly from liquid to solid in there. They also had started to measure molecular weights and they came up with molecular weight measurements which were quite good at that time. So particularly the albumin or the natural rubber with 100,000 by these measurements were really good data. And 
why again this did not help them to develop the concept of macromolecules well at that time osmotic uh, physical chemistry had developed very strongly and people had learned about soap solutions and that they form aggregates the micelles in there they have dealt with hydrated silicic acid in there so they also saw that starch and albumin would behave similar like the soap molecules in a soap solution they just aggregate in there and that's it that was the common the polymerization was aggregation and the aggregates of course they were particularly the polymers were very strong you could not dissolve them anymore so they behave like small crystallites with very strong interactive forces which keeps the molecules together at the same time also the x-ray diffraction came up and became very important tool to understand molecular behavior in there and actually already in 1913 the japanese researchers nishikawa and ono did fiber diagrams from silk molecules or from silk fibers in there and they found out the small unit cells and the unit cell was so small that the idea of a macromolecule fitting in this unit cell was of course absolutely awkward and could not be believed so they believed very much that their unit cell determination helped them to prove a molecule that there are no macromolecules because a molecule could not be larger than the crystallographic unit cell remarkably Polyani in Germany had explicitly mentioned the possibility that the unit cell might compromise just segments of a chain molecule but this was not taken up by the community at all still in 1926 Hermann Mark the very famous American German scientist claimed that the high molecular weight substances cannot be split by dissolution in low molecular weight spaces and that this indicates that these lattice forces are as strong as intermolecular intramolecular bonds and uh, that would mean as strong as covalent bonds in there now 1926 was already six years later than Staudinger did his claim on the macromolecules and he did not like this what Hermann Mark said at that time so they had a strong controversy about macromolecules and polymers and even Hermann Mark in 1928 did not accept the term macromolecules and insisted that a single chain cannot run through different crystallites. At that time, it was clear that it's the unit cell is formed by segments, but not that the chain can even run through different crystallites. And that's why he didn't like the macromolecule. He developed what's called a micellar theory in there. Again, colloidal aggregation and chains are limited in length and in size. At least in 1928, he accepted that the chains can be chains in there, still with limited length. Now, Staudinger was grim about this, and uh, he even in 1940, when Hermann Mark and published together with Kai Meyer, the director of BISF, the first, actually the first book on synthetic high polymers where these things were described as much as possible as it was possible at that time. He didn't, they, again, they called it polymers, they didn't call it macromolecules. And then Stauninger took a piece of paper, glued it in front of the book and wrote in this paper, this book is not a scientific work, but a tendentious pamphlet abroad outside Germany. It might be seen as an evidence for the decline of science in Germany. He was right about the decline of science in Germany, but that was not because of Hermann Mark, it was because of all the scientists who had to leave Germany at that time. Let's go back to the 1920s. At that time, Hermann Staudinger was a well reputed organic chemist at the laboratories in Zurich, at the ATH in Zurich, in there. And he claimed that these macromolecules are formed for uh, uh, the characteristic structure of natural starch of natural rubber of starch of cellulose of proteins of polystyrene of all the materials we know nowadays as polymers 
but he did not have any scientific support in there. Now, in the years late, you, you might ask why it came like this. So it was, of course, there was already a lot of evidence. He had thought about this. And if you look carefully into the literature, you find Hermann Stellinger had joined Engler's laboratory at the Technical University in Karlsruhe. And already in 1897, Engler had stated, if you assume that the double bond are partially dissolved or opened, their slow addition to each other could lead to complex structures. And that even could be with dissimilar, with different type of molecules. So in 1897, Engler had claimed that double bonds may open and cause polymerization, and that you even could have copolymerization. It was just an idea, it was just an assumption in there, but apparently it was alive some way and led Stalinger to make this strong statement in 1920. Because now Stalinger was a very reputed organic chemist and we still know him today for his discovery in chemistry, the cateens, the Ziegler addition of cateens to amines, to beta lactams, and of course the Stalinger reaction of acids with triphenylphosphines, which is now actually used for ligation of peptides and proteins. Stalinger had a very hard time because the other organic chemists did not accept him. Here shown by the um, <coughs> quotation of Heinrich Wieland, who got Nobel Prize in 1927. And he advised him, drop the idea of large molecules. When you purify your rubber, then it will crystallize. Unbelievable some way. Now we can crystallize rubber, but not by purification. So, what did Staudinger do? He stuck to this, his idea and he strongly worked on, heavily worked on, intensively worked on to prove it. And actually after 1922, he published nearly exclusively papers on macromolecules and nothing else in there. What was his proof? He, you know, if two examples in here, one example is, is, is very nice and impressive, and it shows how you can do it systematically. And he could do the polymerization of formaldehyde. If you add formaldehyde, if you add acetic anhydride to formaldehyde, you get this type of polymer, which I said acetate end groups in there. And when he did this polymerization, he carefully separated the different polymers he got or oligomers he got crystallized them by fractionated crystallization or by repeated crystallization, could investigate the single fractions in there, and by this develop the model of polymers and molecular weight distributions in these type of polymers. And by the way, this was also already the first topochemical um, polymerization, so that the formaldehyde polymerizes within the crystal in there. Now he also did a lot of in the viscosity investigation. So he proved that when you take heavier and you hydrogenate it and you get the saturated polymers, that the viscosity is not much different than before. So it worked nicely. So he tried to prove polymerization of macromolecules by viscosity. In 1906, Einstein had developed this very famous viscosity equation in there where he showed that the relative viscosity or that the viscosity you have in a solution depends on the volume fraction of spheres, not on the size of small colloidal spheres, just on the volume fraction. This equation is valid for dilute solution and it became very successful in, 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 in the whole field of colloids in there, but not on the molecular weight, not on the size of the fraction. So Stauninger, was sure, and he measured this actually, that it must be dependent on the size of the molecules on the molecular weight. So he developed his own equation in there. And the way he did it, he said, I have macromolecules, and he always assumed macromolecules are stiff rods, very much supported by his wife, who believed that the grass would cr cr crumple or fall down if they would not be stiff rods, these macromolecules, the cellulose is in there. And so he considered the macromolecule a stiff rod, and then he considered it 
that it tumbles around in a plane to take up the volume of a disk. And because the volume of the disk is proportional to L square, the radius uh, of, of the disk in there, then he got a relation in there that the viscosity is related to molecular weight with the power one or directly proportional to molecular weight. Great equation in there. Unfortunately wrong, we know nowadays, because we know that the macromolecules are not stiff, that uh, there must be an exponent alpha, a scaling exponent in there, which could be 0 0.5 to 0 0.8, depending on the quality of the solvent. It's remarkable that by this equation, he still could take his data, approximate them, and use them to prove that the macromolecules uh, that macromolecules exist at that time. Now, again, you see some conviction in there. The molecules have to be stiff. So it was only in 1936 that um, Werner Kuhn developed the model of the freely jointed chain and the statistical segment length in there. And Schrodinger never liked this. That was not appropriate to him in there. But anyway, now the whole field of the macromolecules was some way developed and suddenly it exploded in there. In 1930, Keras has prepared the first aliphatic polyesters, so polycondensation polymers. And by accident, he found that when one could dry fibers from that, Hermann Mark even estimated now the tensile strength of an ideal cellulose fiber on the base of the crystallographic data and the bond strength, so knowing the size of the unit cells and knowing the number of molecules, two which go through the unit cell, and knowing the bond strengths, you can calculate how strong a fiber could be ideally in there. In 1934, Paul Flory also joined the Le Dupont Laboratory, which then were headed by Carathas in there. And we will see that this is also very um, important and very fruitful uh, combination then at the end. Active chain end polymerization of vinyl monomers was increasingly better understood in there, and people understood this initiation termination business in there. And again, this is related to Staudinger, it's related to Mark, and it's mostly also related to G.V. Schulz in, in Mainz at that time. Now, you might ask the question why Staudinger never did really intensive studies on polycondensation in there. And the answer is very simple. Again, Staudinger believed that the end group reactivity would decrease significantly as the molecular weight increases in there. So they had to be stiff. The end group reactivity had to decrease with molecular weight. There's a number of wrong assumptions in there, but he stuck to them and that also, and they were only solved by other people really at the end. Now, the X-ray diffraction developed very strongly, and I want to show just two examples in there. In 1938, Asbury described the alpha and beta configuration in protein structures, alpha helix and the beta sheet in there. And also in 1938, Grobert did a beautiful experiment on insulin crystals in there, where he found out that the unit cell is so large that a molecule in the unit cell would have a molecular weight of around 40,000 in there. So it was clear to him that this was too large for insulin. And he said, assume maybe there's two insulin molecules in there. No, the size of the unit cell is correct. The 40,000 is correct, but or the, the 38,000 is correct, but it's six insulin molecules inside the unit cells. And then you have the right molecular weight in here. After this, it started something, I said, the, the whole field exploded very strongly, and I call this the, the golden age of macromolecular science. We had nylon 6.6, which the ladies liked very much because of the stockings. Uh, we had the polydimethyl siloxane, where here in Moscow, Andrianov did a great job in developing this, uh, this, this whole field particularly because of the high thermal stability which was needed for the electrical insulation in there. So he really knew what these polymers were good for. Emulsion polymerization in 1953, which is probably the most important year in polymer science, Flory published his book on polymer chemistry, which now brought all this concept together in a very decent way 
in which it was for a long time something like the Bible to study polymers. The coordination polymerization of ethylene happened in 1953. Stoninger got the Nobel Prize in 1953. And Watson and Crick published the double helix in there. In 1954, we had the stereoregular polymerization of propylene, which was the first time that the synthetic polymer could be stereoregular. That's what Nata got the Nobel Prize for. And then, of course, we had more polyurethanes, polycarbonates, polyethylene terephthalate, polyaramids, polytetrafluoroethylene. Now, this is not all in the golden age of macromolecular science. Here I have the whole field of the molecular biology. And I just summarized some dates in there. I mentioned already the double helix, the structure of hemoglobin in the, in, in the 60, the total synthesis of a bioactive protein, insulin. So a chemist could make artificially a bioactive protein or peptide in there. The solid phase synthesis of peptides. That is the, the last really, or one of the last Nobel Prizes in that time, which actually is for polymers. And it starts with the work of Fisher in 1907. Now this led to what I would like to call the second schism of macromolecules. So the macromolecular science split in the field of polymers and it's field, it split in the field of the biomacromolecules. And that is of course, polymers made materials, materials made money, there was a big industry in there and biomacromolecules helped, the concept of biomacromolecules helped us to understand the function and the biological processes in life. Polymers is chemical variety, many, many very different compounds. Biomacromolecules is structural variety. So relatively few monomers and still many, many different con con concepts how to assemble them to different function to, to obtain different functions. And now you might ask me what was the first schism of, of macromolecular science? That was of course the splitting of the colloid field and the macromolecular field. And Staudinger started to develop the concept of the macromolecular of the, of the large macromolecules in there. But this started to, to, to merge again, and nowadays I think there's many institutions which call themselves even polymer and colloid sciences in there. Now, what happened then? What happened then is that we learned to make polymers more precisely in there so that we could do block structures. We could, we could make structures where we knew exactly what the chain ends were. We could make comp type polymers and we learned to make dendrimers in there. An example for the block copolymers is shown here, the ABC block copolymers, where the length of the different blocks and the compatibility, the interaction parameter of the different blocks allows you to make a large variety of superstructures in there, like lamella structures, the cylindrical type structures, and so on and so on. And some of these structures have been really beautiful. Many have not been useful so far. But I come back to very defined molecules and I want to come back to the dendrimers and I show this example of a carboxylane dendrimer, very large, very well defined, and each molecule forms a sphere which has exactly the same size. So it's not only a molecule, it forms a defined sphere of a defined size in there. And that was achieved by synthesis in there. And in this case, by Aziz Musafarov here at Moscow. There's another example of branch structures where I go a little bit to the functionality. When you link, in this case, these conjugated thiophene units in there, shorter segments to longer segments, the shorter segments absorb light in the more bluish range of the visible light and transform the energy to the greenish range or to, to the longer segment which emit the light in the greenish range in there. And what is the result in there? You can make an antenna molecule, which over a large area takes up photons and emits it in a relatively narrow band at the core or at a defined place. That's a very important principle for the light harvesting complex in nature in there. Now, I mentioned nature already, and from nature, of course, people learned quickly that it's not just the atoms, 
It's not just the macromolecules. It's the way how you can assemble macromolecules. You saw already the example from the block polymer. It's the way how you can assemble macromolecules to superstructures in there. And these superstructures make the function in here. And that's, of course, was a challenge for the polymer scientists. And they started with this quite early. Here I have the example of an ionomer. And in this ionomer, we have a hydrophobic polyethylene chain linked, and we have carboxyl carboxylic acid groups in there as, as introduced as metacrylic acid co-monomers in there. And these form, after neutralization, strong dipoles which aggregate, and they form now clusters of ionic clusters inside the material. So that's a thermal reversible cross-linked material. If you heat it up, the clusters get more mobile and you can transform it in shape. You can reshape it, it can flow in there. But what it also can do, and that's quite remarkable, it's a beautiful self-healing material. If you shoot a bullet through there, the bullet forms a hole, but the hole closes after the bullet has passed and the material becomes dense again in there. Now this self-healing process only works at the temperatures which the bullet create while it goes through the material. So it works at very high temperatures. And we are now working on to make relatively large defects in the material and make sure that they close even at lower temperatures under well-defined conditions. And then this is based on the ionomers. So this aggregation can be used. Now what you learn here, it's not just the supramolecular structure, it's also the characteristic times in this type of material, how these structures can relax and how they can reconstruct and reconstitute some way and with which time and which time scales this will happen. Now going back from this non-directed ionic interactions, we can go to directed non-covalent bonds. And this is of course hydrogen bonds, they are directed bonds in there. And when people learned how to deal with multiple hydrogen bonds, then they had a stronger hydrogen bonding and they could use it for materials. Here, for example, the example for the triple hydrogen bonds from Jean-Marie Lane, or in the next slide, the example from the quadruple hydrogen bonds, which was done by Bert Meyer in Eindhoven in there. That's a very intriguing unit, this UDP, how they call it. It's based on a urethane addition in there. And it, it nicely forms these, these hydrogen bonds where you can see that the donor accept the direct, at least pairwise in the same direction. So the hydrogen bonds really make each other stronger than they would be a single bond. And then you can make materials like it is shown here. They are flexible and, and, and but nicely coherent in there. But there's a trick about this type of materials which goes a step further. And this is this unit is a flat unit and it can stack. And when it stacks, there's pi pi interaction, there are certain interactions in there. And what you have then is that actually they form something like a cluster. In this case, the cluster is this column type structure in there. But that means if they stack together, you have more in one stack than just two linking units in there. And that improves the strength of the step, spec. And the improvement comes from the cooperativity of this type of effect. When the first disc is formed, it helps the second disc to form on top. And this helps the third disc to form on top. And you see here what would be if the disc would form independently from each other, you would have these type of smooth transition from bonded to non-bonded. And if they are Stacking like this, you have the transition like it is shown here with a critical concentration and a strong cooperative effect, which makes the material even stronger in there. Now we not only can introduce new synthetic concepts, we also can use the concepts of nature for materials. And that is shown here at the example of the structural DNA nanotechnology. We all know that DNA can form a double helix in there and that it's characteristic for the double helix that the sequence on one strand has to fit exactly to the sequence on the other strand. So there's a lot of information encoded in here which makes it highly selective and highly specific. But the DNA can not only make double strands, there is this I-motive which is something like a small 
fold in there, which shortens the chain at a certain moment. There is triple helices, which can be formed. There's the quadrupole complex. And you can use this together with the information which is stored in there for construction. And the principle of the construction is shown in here. You take a very long molecule of DNA. You can take this from nature, for example, from a lambda uh, phage, the, the DNA of a lambda phage, which is 10 micrometers long in here. And then you, you know the sequence exactly, the, the, the base sequence along there. You know this exactly. And you can construct small oligomers, which glue them together or which sticks, sticks them together just at the place where you want it. This oligomer here and that oligomer here, like it is shown in here. And there's computer programs now, and if you do it nicely, you can cause the lambda DNA to fold up in a way like it is shown here to form at the end this mighty end there. And that this was possible is shown in here by the electron micrographs from Rosamond in here. Other things are possible, like the periodic 2D lattice in there, or mesh in here, like three-dimensional structures like shown in here. So all these things have been done. And nowadays we can do it, or people can do it even in the gram scale already, and not only on the micro. So we have this further development going back towards aggregation, association, reversible bonds and to use these to control the build-up in what I call the hierarchical structure. Now made nature can do even more and it can make, take these hierarchical structures in order to have certain activities. One of the most primitive but still very impressive example is this pine cone where when the air is dry it opens, the semen can flow out, and if it rains and the air is humid, it closes and the semen is protected. And this opening and closing is programmed in the structure of the material, and it's a dead material. You can do it even microscopically in order to make window shades nowadays, which open automatically and which close automatically depending on humidity or light or whatever you use. Another example for that is shown in here. This is this plant and the, the leaves of the plant orient towards the sun, depending on the daylight time or the daylight in here. And this is a movie during 24 hours in there. And what you will see at the end of the day in the night, the leaves will fall down and they can go to sleep in there. Just imagine if you want to do that with a solar panel, you need an engine, you need a program, you need the controller in order to do this, you need photosensitive cells. Here, everything is programmed in the material structure, in the structure of the leaves. The, the leaves do not have an engine which tell you now turn around in here. They just fold up as they sense the light. I switch to another example in there and I want to go to vesicles. Vesicles are a field where we know without vesicles, we would not have life in our world. And if you would not have life, uh, of course, we would not sit together here today. And I want to show an example of a polymer vesicle, a completely unnatural vesicle in this case. And this completely unnatural vesicle in this case was formed from a linear polymer with side chains, which went to the polymer by ionic interaction or by base uh, acid neutralization in there. So the backbone is hydrophilic, the side chains are hydrophobic, and what you see here, they form beautiful vesicles. They not only form beautiful vesicles, the vesicles have exactly the thickness as lipid vesicles have them. So now we have a polymer, which is more, the, where the vesicle formation is more stable because of the polymerization, because of these backbone chains which run, run along the vesicle membrane in here, but still they are compatible to the natural lipids in there. And you could introduce proteins in the, in the membrane and uh, membrane proteins and play with this. These things form multi-layer vesicles and you can play with those multi-layer la vesicles. Like I showed before here, there is an azo group in there which is light sensitive. And if you, sh if you shine light on it, these vesicles will explode and you can switch them out but they only open slowly. My lipid vesicles will open very quickly 
if you disturb their assembly by some interaction from outside. Now, why do I think vesicles are important? I want to show you another example in there. And one of the transport mechanisms by which signals are transported from one cell to the other, by which we have infections, if you have a bacterium in there, is that the vesicles absorb a particle or an object, and then they engulf it, and it's taken inside the cell in there. And this type of phagocytosis or endocytosis is a very important process in nature, as you all know very well. Now let's look at that. Can we do this very easily? And we can, because there is some very simple physics behind there. And that is shown in here. If you have a particle which absorbs at the vesicle, the question whether the vesicle will start to wrap up the particle is determined by the strength of the absorption energy. If it's large, the particle will uh, have, has a lot of power to deform the vesicle shape and by the elasticity, the flexibility of the vesicle membrane in there. And both of them can be manipulated. And if you manipulate them, or if you, if you evaluate this, you come out but as large as the particle is, as less you have to bend the, the, the membrane and as slower can be the adhesion energy in order to have the conditions for this type of engulfment. So you can use this, and this is shown in here. If you have a particle absorbed by the membrane and the adsorber molecules in the membrane can, uh, be, can, can move laterally, they will be called together by the particle. The particle can absorb more strongly and even more strongly. And finally, it is engulfed. I just showed this example that it really works. What we have here is an artificial vesicle from artificial molecules. In this case, the molecules were amphiphilic type dendrimus in there. And so we had a membrane which was a little bit more stable than a lipid membrane. And you have an Escheria coli. Uh, bacterium in there and the bacterium absorbs at the membrane and when it absorbs at the membrane it gets wrapped and internalized as it shown so shown in here and by this way it finally gets deactivated and cannot contribute to further infections anymore because inside the vesicle it lacks all the other uh, means it needs in order to do his infectious job last example is look at uh, how can we get energy in there. In the example before, we got the energy because of the adsorption energy. But in this case, we would like to pump energy in there. And of course, the energy to pump in there is nature, it's life, it's the uh, photosynthesis. And so life is, is, is obvious in there. What we choose for is we said when we have small gold rods or silver rods in there, they absorb light by the plasmonic uh, absorption in there and they dissipate this light as heat. So we can have small heating elements in there and rods are better than spheres in there. Just for a fun here, it's an example. You have a plastic film and in this plastic film you have, in this case, it's spheres. And if you look at it in reflection, they shine, they, they, they appear red. And if you look at it in transmission, they are bluish in there, and this is because in transmission you see the absorption, and in reflection you see the scattered light mostly. You do not need to do this with gold nanorods. You might think they are expensive in there. You can do the same thing with a number of uh, small particles from semiconductors, and as an example here, the lantern hexaboride, which also has a plasmonic resonance band in the range of the near infrared in here. Now, for example, here we have a fiber of nylon, which was blended with these small lantern hexaboride particles. And when you shine infrared light on it, you see local heating at this spot. And the local heating even can cause bending and change the shape of the material in there. You can use this for welding. You can also use it to have transparent infrared absorbers. So if you want to have windows where the infrared light does not go through there, or where you would like to, to heat even by the windows, you can use this. Now we use this 
to make the material to perform as an engine in there. And what we use needed for an engine, for an engine, you would like to have volume changes and they're like in a combustion engine. And one of the material volume changes is the responsive hydrogels. And at low temperature, the hydrogels are strongly swollen. At high temperature, the hydrogels collapse in there according to the lower critical solution behavior of these type of hydrogen uh, water swollen materials in there caused by the hydrophobic interaction. Now, when you fill such a hydrogel with a few number of these rods, these rods work as local heating elements. And the distance between the rods can be relatively small. So if you have one to three rods per cubic micrometer, it's sufficient to heat up the material from inside the gel from inside very quickly and very efficiently in here. And that is what is shown here. When you take such an L-shaped hydrogel body and you heat it up very slowly, it just will shrink in its dimension, but it will keep its dimension. If you now you heat it up very quickly, it will be heated up quicker than the water can go out. And just in this simple geometry, you have parts where the water has a longer way to go out and parts where the water has a slower way to go out. And this results, this heterogeneous deformation, which here is the nice tweezer action you see in the movie in there. Very fast, very large amplitudes can be created like this. You also can do this with a wedge in here. Now, if you, you see, this is a hydrogel in this wedge type form. And if you put it into water, you let it swell, it forms a helix. And actually, because of the wedge, the helix is conical in there. And when you now irradiate it with stroposcopic light, it will start to move because it um, decoils and, and recoils again. And because it knows its head and its tail, it moves forward in its own direction in here. So the example has demonstrated that you really can make small objects mobile and actuate them, that they swim. And in this case, they sw swim like in bacterium in there. Of course, the organism, the system of the bacterium is much more complex. It contains the chlorophyll in there, it has light harvesting, the light is converted to fuel and metabolism, and then the bacterium can move around as long as the sun is shining, and you see it does it beautifully and in a very controlled way. We are just at the beginning to do things like this. With this, I come to the end, and I want to say, to, to, to finish with two statements in here. The first statement is, what do we learn from nature? That is, of course, the transformation from molecules to molecular systems, molecules to nanoobjects, nanoobjects to microsystems, and the microsystems ultimately, if we would be as good as nature to alive matter. What is the ability to do this, to achieve these advanced properties? Now, nature did it by evolution. Evolution as the selection principle by which the good structures, the intelligent structures could be selected in there. What does it mean for the development of, of material science in there? What we learn is the information content and the information processing is a key object. If we want to go this step for biologization of material science further, we must learn how to program the action in a material structure in there. And of course, we also need to select the right structures. We cannot just do it by trial and error as nature did it. So we need to have a good educated guess. And that means we need to have a very well developed physical understanding for this. And we need simulations in order to do this. Still having in mind that the complexity in nature developed a level which is so high that at the end you had emergent properties that the cells could make decisions and say, oh, now I would like to behave like this, and now I would like to behave like this on very small and minuscule differences in their environment in there. And this way towards complexity is long, and that means there's a lot of research to be done in the future. Where are we and why, why can we attack this problem? 
Now what we learned in the past is the precision synthesis and we learned more and more about self-assembly and how to control self-assembly. In parallel, we have the bioengineering which allows us to play with the natural components and to design, even to redesign natural components to get very well-defined molecules from nature, from natural sources in there. We have the lithography and other miniaturization like the additive manufacturing now, which allows us to manipulate structures on at least on the mesoscale in there. And of course, we need the physics theory and simulation to understand these things and to manipulate them, to forecast them, to have the right guess. And then we would come to the true molecular systems engineering, which will help us to develop really highly functional materials. Now, what is the consequence of this? I think we need a new approach in science. We need young scientists which are educated to collaborate with the people from other disciplines across the border. We need to make sure that we get the good communication, that we understand each other and that we do not develop our own languages in this discipline and another language in the other discipline so people do not understand each other anymore. But then there is a lot to do, and there's a lot of success which can be come in the future in there. And I like to put this together like here. Men learned to use materials in order to make tools. This started in the Stone Ages. Men learned to make better materials, to make better tools in there, which was until the 19th, 20th century in there. And now men will start to learn to make materials like, nat like nature does it. And we are somewhere on a tipping point in science and engineering. I think by this, I would like to close and I hope it was interesting for you and you are as optimistic as myself in the future of polymer science. Thank you very, very much. Now, before I close, finally, I would like to thank Virtue Perchek who helped me, gave me many hints about what to put together here. And of course, Herbert Morawitz and his book, The Origins and Growth of a Science on the Early History of Polymer Science. And I want to thank the Russian government for giving me the grant, which also is one of the reasons why I could talk here. Thank you very much. <laughs>